Chapter 1 of Saints and Stars Are there more grains of sand on earth or stars in the universe? With your eyes alone, you can see at least a couple of thousand stars on a clear night, well away from artificial lights and nearer for a thousand if it's moonless and your sight is keen. In, an, in a handful of sand, are many more grains than that, but space is huge, dauntingly so, and powerful telescopes reveal that it contains a host of galaxies, each harboring billions of stars. On the other hand, the deserts, beach, and ocean and ocean beds of our planet are home to sand particles in dizzying profusion. So. Sands or stars, which wins in the number in the numbers game. A study carried out by researchers at, un at the University of Hawaii in 2003 estimated the number of sand grains in the world to be 7.5 million trillion, or 75 followed by se 17 zeros. As for stars. The figure they, the figure they came up with for the whole for the whole of the observable universe was seventy thousand million trillion. That's about ten thousand stars for every sand grain. The Greek mathematician and scientist Archimedes was also interested in this kind of problem. In the third century BCE he wrote a short treatise addressed to Gelon, king of Syracuse, that's come to be known as the Saint Reconner, sometimes described as the first research expository paper because it combines both accuracy and clear language aimed at the lay person. It asks how many grains of sand would fit in the universe. The answer, of course, depends on how big is an average grade of sand and how big is the universe. Archimedes featured very generously to the point of being unrealistic that one poppy seed could contain 10,000 grains of sand, but which would make the grains almost microscopy in size. He also recalled that 40 Forty poppy seeds side by side would stretch across one Greek dactyl or finger width equal to about to about three quarters of an inch or nine or nineteen millimeters. As far one dactyl wide would then be able to hold in the region of six hundred forty million cent grains. As for the size of the universe, Archimedes based his estimate on the classical heliocentric theory of his predecessor Aristarchus. In this model of space, Earth orbits around Earth orbits around the Sun, while the stars are fixed into a sphere, also centered to the Sun, also centered on the Sun, but much further out. The fact that the Greeks couldn't discern any change in the relative positions of, star, of stars in the sky. A so-called parallax, as it moved from one side of the sun to the other, meant that star had to lie a certain minimum distance away. This gave Archimedes his estimate for the smallest possible diameter of the then known universe in modern units about two last years. Today we can easily do the math to the do the math and arrive at how many Archimedean size size sand grains would fit inside a ball to like to light years wide. The answers come out to be roughly one followed one followed by sixty three zeros, which can written completely as 
the number of him the the problem Archimedes faced it the the problem Archimedes faced is that our handy ways of representing big numbers didn't exist in this in his day. The Arabic numerals zero to nine that we now use and makes about eight hundred years later and in and in India not Arabia. Please will notation in which the same symbol is used to represent the orders of magnitude depending on its position. For example, 3 in 30, 3013 was still in its infancy of Babylon but hadn't yet reached, but hadn't yet reached Greece. And there was, there was in those days no such thing as index notation in which how many times a number must be multiplied by itself is written as superscribed as in 10 as in 10 to the 63 at a time when Archimedes began his comic set calculations the Greek used letters of the alphabet to represent numbers. The different letter stood the di a different letter stood for the equivalent of our numbers one to nine multiplies of ten from ten to nine to ninety and multiplies of a hundred from one hundred to nine hundred. The familiar twenty four letters alpha to omega which have survived in present day Greek had to be supplemented by others taken for other languages and dialects to provide enough levels. Alphabet to theta stood from 10 to 9, iota to kappa, borrowed from the Phoenician, from multiplies of 10 from 10 to 90, and rho to sampi, used in some Eastern Ionic dialects, from multiplies a hundred from 100 to 900. The Greek didn't use the same letter again and again in different positions so that, for example, 222 will be, will be written as Sigma Kappa Beta equals 200 plus 20 plus 2 for multiplies of a thousand from 1000 to 9000 some of the letters were employed but with various extra marks and that was and that was as far as the ancient greek labeling labeling systems of numeral of numeral went except from murius the log single unit defined as written as uh, as written the long simple unit defined written as a capital mu and equivalent to our 10,000. The Romans called it myriad, a name, a name that became a name that became absorbed into English, but with the altered with the altered meaning of countless, of a very large but undefined number. The Greeks could write numbers that were bigger than a murius, but only a multiplies of m, using strings of letters in the manner described. For example, 1,234,000, will be written as Rho, Kappa, Gamma, Mu, Delta, V, C, C Zeta, 123 times 10,000 plus 4,567. 4, it's an approach that clearly runs of our of steam for anything beyond that we called a few hundred million. Archimedes realized that to represent the kind of gigantic numbers that will arise for his cosmic sense calculations, he'd have to become up with a whole, num whole new system of number naming, he started by defining anything up to
to a myriad myriad as, be, as begin as being a number of the first order to use that to use that to us that might don't might don't seem like a big step because we can easily write a myriad myriad as 10 to 10 to 4 times 10 to 4 which equal 10, 10 to 8 a hundred million and they carry and they carry on indefinitely from there but there was nothing like our index notation in which I, in which an index exponent is is used to show how many times a number must be multiplied by itself when Archimedes took on his big number project having defined any number up to a, uh, up to a myriad myriad as belonging to, to the first order, he moved on the numbers that lay, be, be, they lay between a myriad and myriad, and a myriad myriad times a myriad myriad, one follow one followed by sixteen zeros, or one to sixteen, or ten to sixteen, in modern notation. This, he said, belonged to the second order. Then he progressed to the third order and the fourth and so on in the same way is successive order, order being a myriad a myriad times larger than the numbers of the previous order eventually he reached numbers of the myriad myriad order in or, in other words in our index notation 10 to 8 multiplies multiplied by itself 10 to 8 times or 10 to 8 raised to the power 10 to 8 which is equal 10 to 8, 10 to 800 million. All these numbers, of which the largest would be, all these numbers, all which the largest would have 100 million digits. If you write it, if you if it written out in full, it defined as belonging to the first period. The number 10 to 100 million itself he took be the springboard from the second period at which point he he began the process all over again he defined orders he defined orders of the second period by the same method each new order being a myriad myriad times greater than the last until the end of the myriad myriad period he reached the colossal failure of a, of a myriad myriad race to the power of a myriad myriad times a myriad myriad which with which with which with guide us or 10 to the power of 80,000 trillion remember Archimedes has no had no knowledge of our compact ways of writing big numbers there wasn't even the concept of zero in ancient Greek maths, starting for a system that struggled, the struggle to a number na to na starting for a system, the struggle to name numbers that were bigger than a few hundred million, he fashioned a method to describe a number that, in the sima form, would have 80,000 trillion, 80,000 trillion digits. For the purposes of his hand counting project, it turns out Archimedes did not need numbers anywhere near this large. Using his estimates of the size of a grain of sand and of the end of the whole universe, he came up with a value that was only the eighth order of the first period. In, in, in index notation, a mere eight times. 10 to 63 or so of Archimedes minuscule grains would have been enough to pack the two like year two like year wide Greek cosmos full of sand. If we even using a modern and much larger estimate for the diameter of the observable universe of 92 billion light years, there'd be no room for more than about 10 to 69. 10 to 95 cent grains, still a number of just the 12th order first period.
The sundry corner was cutting edge stuff. Not only the Archimedes over a picture of the universe that most closely resembles what we know today, given the limited data he had available, but he invented a whole new way of describing biggest numbers. He was the first person to tackle the problem of naming and manipulating large numbers without, be without the benefit of modern notation. Using a system with base 10,000, he effectively pure the exponentiation, the process of raising one quantity to the power of another. He also discovered the law of adding exponents, namely, x to the m times x to the n equals x to the m plus n for the, for the number x, m, n, for example, 3 squared times 3 cubed, 3 squared times 3 cubed equals 3 times 3 times 3 times 3 times 3 equals 3 times 3 to the 5th, 3 to the 5th. Archimedes was the first person to show that it's possible to go beyond the tradition of his era of simply calling huge numbers of the of things innumerable. Sun, sand and stars in particular came in a lot for this kind of treatment. The Greek poet Pindar, who predated Archimedes, wrote in his Olympus Odet second, Saint escapes, escapes counting. There's even Greek, a Greek word, Sama Koshi, literally Saint Hundred, that's used to mean uncountable. Writers of Bible, too, gave up on the arithmetic saint on stars. The phrase in Genesis chapter 30, 32, verse 12, the sand of sea, which cannot be counted for multitude, is one of the 21, is one of the 31 biblical references suggesting that it is impossible to put a figure on the numbers of sand grains out there. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 12, conflicts the two. So many as the stars of the sky in the multitude and as the strand which by the scissor is innumerable. As we've seen, Archimedes didn't confine himself to the sand on a seashore or even on the earth as a whole. He made, he made sure that none of his contemporaries could possibly outdo his number count by imagining the entire universe to be packed to be packed full of sand grains, so small that they'd be barely visible. It would be interesting to know what he'd have thought of the efforts of other intellectuals a few hundred years later, who also wrote about large numbers but in a different part of the world, and for a very different reason. Eastern philosophy, and Buddhism in particular, has always been fascinating has, al has always been fascinated with the fastest of space, time, and mind. It's not surprising then the scholars of these third systems eventually came around the putting numbers to the to the edge of extent of things on the broadcast uh, on the borders of cosmic scales. In one of the major scriptures or sutras of Mahayana Buddhism, written in the third century CE and known as Lalita, Lalita Vistara, Sanskrit, Sanskrit for the play in full, a conversation, a conversation takes place between Gautama Buddha, who died the hundreds of years earlier, and a mythical mathematician named Arjuna. In reply to a question by Arjuna, the Buddha launches, a st launches into a head-spinning exposition of a system of numeral, numerals based on the Koti, a Sanskrit term from 10 million. As it, at each step, the Buddha names a, num a number that's 100 times greater than the last. One Ayuta is 100 Koti, one Yuta is 100 Ayuta, so on, until he reached Talaksana, which equals one followed by 50. 53 zeros. Beyond the rest of the Talaksana, the Buddha explains lies another, that of the 
dua ja, dua ja, dua ya gawati which takes which takes us to 1 to the 99 and the four others in the sending hierarchy they reach up to the utara para manu raja manu raja pravesa equals to 10 to 410 to 421 impressive thought this number is the Buddha's only just getting into his right. In the Awa, Awa Tamsaka, Lower Garland Sutra, he reveals a different and has a more powerful counting system. In Thomas Cleary's translation of chapter 30 of the Awa Tamsaka, Buddha explains how the system starts off. 10 to, 10 to the 10 power times 10 to the 10 powers equals 10 to the 20th power 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 20th power times 10 to the 20th power is 10 to the 40th powers then he continues in exasperating detail square each successive number to yield 10 to the 80, 10 to 160, 10 to 320, and so on, until after a couple, until after a couple most call words of intervisation, he arrives at. For some reason, unfortunately, not explained in the sutra, Buddha considers in this number to make some kind of limit. Further squaring, he says, lead to a number called incalculable. Then next, he moves the square in the square. In other words, raising to the fourth power, incalculable to the fourth power gives measureless. Repeating the process leads to boundless. After some more similar steps and excursions into the Sanskrit thesaurus, were led to unspeakable the racing to the fourth power of which culminates in untold. Then, in the final flourish, the Buddha reports that untold unspeakables fill all unspeakables. In unspeakable accounts, explanation of the unspeakable cannot be unfinished. Quite why does must quite why those who wrote the Awatamsaka had the Buddha stop doing precise maths at incalculable and resort instead to a string of superlatives isn't clear. Maybe they got bored with writing out with writing out long list numeral of numerals and or perhaps scrolls were in short sub supply. The likeliest reason though is that they wanted to give the impression that, in the end, the universe, the universe extends beyond ordinary logic and analysis into a realm accessible only to those who are enlightened. In any event, we can easily take the mystery out of all, out of all these Sega Senangians. The mic untold, far from being calcul incalculable or untellable, works out in reality to be in modern notation 10 to the 10 times 2 times 122 or approximately it's obviously it's it's obviously a truly fast number Archimedes would doubtless have been impressed with it because it dwarfed the biggest number he reached the century corner Archimedes makes out at whereas to reach and thought you'd have to multiply Archimedes number by itself roughly 900, 660 million trillion times. But Archimedes and the Buddhist Sutras use large numbers to give some impression of the immensity of the respective affections of the universe. With Archimedes, it was more scientific enterprise, whereas the Eastern Gold, whereas the Eastern Gold's 
goal seems to have been inspired reference to for a holistic vision of the cosmos inaccessible to conventional thought. These were early in isolated peaks in the quest to describe ever, ever larger numbers. Only comparatively recently, within the past century and a half, have mathematicians given much thought to looking at what lies beyond these seminal insights or numbers that are incomparably larger and, at cons and as, cons as a consequence demand innovations in order that they can be represented in a manageable way. For most practical purposes, where, whether it's everyday conversation, economics, or measurement in science, we use words ending in Ilion to name, to name big numbers. The current world population is about 7.8 billion. The nearest star Proxima Centauri lies at distance 40.2 trillion kilometers and so on. It's a method of number naming that has its roots in that medieval times when the word million began to appear in writing such as culture, the Canterbury Tales. Million came from comes from the Italian millione, which in turn stems from the Latin mille for thousand and augmentative suffix one, hence million, thousand, thousand. Billion, a million, million, and trillion, a, tr a million, 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 were in calcul were in circulation by 14, 1470s and in in 1484, in 14, the Frenchman Nicolas Keket proposed a, comp proposed a complex systemization of number names using using words ending in Ilion or Yiliot. Not much is known about Duquet. Beyond that, he was born in Paris, held a bachelor degree in medicine, and later moved to Lyon, where he died in his thirties. He certainly wasn't an eminent mathematician. He is remembered today for only one achievement, an article called Triparty and La Science de Nom des Nombres, the science of numbers in three parts which wasn't published in until 1880s, almost four centuries after his death by the linguist Aristide Mer, who discovered Jacquet's manuscript. It then, be it then became clear that the student of Jacquet, Estienne de la Roche, had essentially plagiarized his, teacher, his teacher's writings in the first part of his handbook of algebra Le Arithmetic 1520s in his original work. In his original work, Joker had gotten a very large number and thus used marks to break it down into groups of six digits starting from the right. After the first marks, after the first mark were the millions thereafter. The second mark, billion the third mark trillion, the fourth part quadrillion, the fifth trillion, the sixth sixillion, the seventh septillion, the eighth octillion, the ninth nonillion, and so on with others as far as you wish to go. We still use these names, which were replaced by I and other minor day changes today. The only difference is that it's become widely accepted in English speaking countries and some and some others that the billion is thousand million rather than a million million. Two different name two different naming systems for large numbers emerged which in nineteen forty in nineteen sixty in nineteen seventy four first mathematician Jenny Genevieve Vittel described as the long scale and the short scale in the former each after a million, a billion, a trillion, and so on, 
it is, is defined to be a million times larger than the one before, whereas in the latter jumps are by a factor of a thousand. And with English, both systems were used up until the mid 1970s or so. Today, the short scale long far forward in North America has been adopted in most of the English speaking and Arabic speaking world, as well as in Brazil, Russia, and several other countries, while the long scale remains in force as well. The system can easily be extended beyond a trillion using the prefix quad, queen, sex, sept, and so on, a quadrillion for instance, for instance. Using the short scale is a thousand times greater than a trillion or 10 to 15, a quintillion is a thousand times greater than a quadrillion or 10 to 18 and so on. Each multiply of a thousand bumps, the prefix up by one, a centillion, cent mean meaning a hundred is the same as is the same as one followed by three hundred thirty zeros and is the biggest number listed in standard dictionaries with a name that gives this convention. That every additional three zeros advanced by one the, by one the Latin or Greek number prefix. A few this a few cent until a few centuries ago there was really no practical need to have names for numbers that were much bigger than a million, unless you were doing something unusual like counting sense grains or restoring Eastern philosophy. It wasn't until the start of the 19th century that the world's population ticked past a billion and later still that atoms were discovered and astronomers started to appreciate how many stars were in our galaxy. Never mind all those that lie beyond. But pure mathematicians are unconfined by the limits of physical reality and early on they realized that numbers went on and on eventually far exceeding any system that had been devised for their description. By the dawn of the Renaissance, it had become simply unacceptable that numbers could exist for which there were neither convenient names nor ways to represent them. To get systemized this alien way of naming numbers. While Archimedes and others, including Muhammad ibn Musa al Khwarizmi in 19th century Persia and Abu Hassan ibn Ali al Khalasadi, the mid 15th century, laid the basis for exponentiation. The word exponent itself was coined in 1544 by German mathematician and mock. And, and more, Mr. Stiefel. Finally, in the early 16th century, French mathematician and philosopher Rene Descartes, in Book 1 of his text La Geometrie, introduced not notation of, for of the form x to the n. Although at the time he was thinking more in terms of geometry than algebra. In the expression x to the n, x is a number noun as the base and n is the index or exponent. It's also common for n to be called the power of x, although strictly speaking if a equals a, a equals x to the n, then a is the power not n. Just as multiplication can can be thought of as repeated addition, 4 times 3 equals 3 plus 3 plus 3 Plus 3. Exponentiation is a compact way of writing and for performing repeated multiplication. For almost every purpose we need, except of many those we'll meet in this book, exponentiation or working in, the, in index form is a vision for dealing with extraordinary large numbers, a number such as a hundred million trillion can, can be written compactly as 10 to the to the 20 and described as 10 to the power 20 or just 10 to the 20. For the most part, for the most part, describing big numbers in terms of aliens, of of aliens works just fine. But something, but sometimes it's good to have a special name 
for a particular glass number. One day, in 19, in 1920, American mathematician Edward Kastner was working with his nephews, nine-year-old nine Milton Sirota and his brother Edwin, by the Palisades, the cliffs that line the Hudson River in New Jersey. Kastner called talking to them about numbers and how big they could be as big as, say, one followed by a hundred zeros. Writing later in Mathematics and the Imagination, which he co which he co-authored with James Newman, Kastner recalled, Milton was very certain that his number was not infinite and therefore equally certain that it had to have a name. The, na the name he came up with a Google. At the same time, young Milton suggested Googleplex for a number that was even bigger. Kastner wrote, Kastner wrote, A Googleplex is much larger than a Google, but it's still finite, as the inventor of the name was quick to point out. It was suggested that a Googleplex a Google Plex should be one should be one followed by writing zeros until you get tired. This is a description of what would happen if you actually tried to write a Google Plex, but different people get tired at different times, and it would and it would never to do, and it would never do to have Car Carnera, a heavyweight boxing champion a better mathematician than Dr. Einstein, sim simply because he had more endurance. Kastner offered a more precise definition of a Googleplex is 1 followed by a Google number of zeros or 1 or 10 to the Google, whereas a Google, albeit hard to imagine, is easy to write is easy to write out in full. A Googleplex is sensationally larger. There isn't, pa there isn't enough pa paper on earth or come to that matter in the entire observable universe to write out the digits of a Googleplex, not even if you wrote each zero as small as the a subatomic particle. The Googleplex utterly dwarfs any number named in antiquity including the mighty untaught. Mention Google or Googleplex and most people will instantly think of the ubiquitous search engine of the place where it's now headquartered. In, the, in 1996, the founders, of what, the founders of what would become Google, Stanford PhD students, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, were working out of a makeshift office, a garage rented to them by mutual friend and the future and future YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki in Menlo Park, California. They called the, the prototype search engine Backrub because it analyzed by the web's backlinks and coming links to a web web page. But as the search technology rapidly improved. They sought a more commercially appealing, appealing name for the new product in September 1997. Page and his office and his office mates held a brainstorming session complete with whiteboard in Susan's garage to think of something that would work, a word that captured the idea of indexing a huge amount of data. One of those present graduate students sent Anderson suggested Google Googleplex which page immediately sorted out sorted out sorted out lot to Google. Anderson at his Anderson sat at his own computer terminal, checked the internet domain registry to see if the name was still available for register was for registration and use. But making the mistake of thinking that the word was spelled Google what was spell, was spelled Google, he checked Google.com instead of Google.com and found it to be available. Page, page liked the name and within how and within hours had registered Google.com on behalf of himself and Brin. The name is certainly suggestive of the immense volume of data 
now in fourth in web indexing in 2017. Google reported that it stored information on about 30 trillion pages. Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook between them and Facebook between them hold at least 1,200 1, petabytes of data, a feature that's a feature that's rising fast, month by month. If Google were to maintain its average annual rate of growth and in indexing over the next few centuries, unlikely, it would have an index a Google page by the year to 2698. In ancient times, only a few intellectuals such as Archimedes claims how very large numbers might be relevant to the real world, but today, we're all familiar with hearing about billions and trillions of things and scientists and mathematicians find uses for numbers that make even the Google seem small. Can we truly grasp the size of these numbers, let alone the vastness of others we'll, we'll counter later on in our quest to find the biggest number of all? No. Not even the greatest mathematician, mathematical genius can do that. But what we can do is try to find words or concepts that form a bridge between the world with which we're familiar, the world we can sense of const or construct in our imagination to numbers that lie far beyond in the capacity of the physical universe to contain.